This is 2OF Entertainment. Good afternoon or good morning. Good evening, Paul, to you. Good evening. Good afternoon. <laughs> good, good morning <laughs> here this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good to see you again. And uh, yeah, just you. about made it. Just about made it because all this is oh, a, a pre show yeah. uh, that all the clocks changed. So uh, my brain is com completely somewhere else. Yeah. Well, uh, North America will be changing over here in a week or so. So we'll have another. <clears throat> Pick up probably every time you figure out <laughs> who's who is where for the winter. Yeah, it'll be yeah. just fine. No, you know what? We have some. Uh, we have a, a great artist here today uh, again, and uh, should warm the should warm everybody's heart just a little bit to be able to see all these lovely landscapes. Um, plein air painter um, Karen Haynes uh, from Alberta, and so I think. These are a lot of the artists are just like the traditionals of painting, right? And we, we really yeah. we look at say, do you need to paint every leaf on a tree? Do you need to, to get the feeling in the essence? Yes, Paul. Of the yes, land Paul. Do you need to do that? <laughs> well, you might as well then number them right, if you're going to do that. And uh, that's what that's I. That's the only way I can paint, as you know. You see my painting; it's all paint by number. Oh well, as long as you know your numbers, yeah. you're good to go. And I think uh, it's kind of fun to paint those things once in a while. And you just realize. The complexities that a lot of those artists it, it means somebody had to figure those color palettes out to start with yeah and number them and figure it all out so there's quite a bit of uh and you're and you're anticipating how that person that young person or whatever inexperienced person is going to use those colors to make that picture look like it's yeah. supposed to be on the, i used to use just use the paint i used to like <laughs> I'd get one of those and I'd say, oh, great, look at all these colors. And I'd just go make my own painting. But uh, I rarely ever made the cheetah or the animal painting. I, you know, just, it did. If I did, it wasn't through the, it was, I colored outside the lines. And I hope, yeah. I hope more. Oh, know, but what about our guest today? Is she a lady that colors outside the lines? Do you let think? You, let's just talk to her. We'll bring her in and we'll, uh, okay, we'll and, take um, Karen in here and we'll just, we'll just. That'll be the opening question. Do you do you color outside the lines? Yeah. <laughs> yeah good morning. Yeah. Good morning, Karen. Um, yeah. Good morning. Yeah. So, do you color outside Hello. the lines? Is, is that is, is that, that a is serious that a question? <laughs> yeah, that's a serious. Yeah, question. well, it, well, it is. It is for me, um, someone who can only who you know. I struggle to open the coloring book, let alone paint in it, but. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see lines actually. <laughs> when when you when, you, when I think of it, I'm seeing just shapes, and values. I'm not seeing lines okay. at all. <laughs> but no. Well, I think I think on that note, Paul, I, I better just go back to practicing my my okay. my painting we'll, by we'll numbers continue and, the conversation. Uh, yeah. and I'll, I'll see you guys at the end of the show. Have a great show, anyway. Lovely okay. to meet you, guys. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. Well, quite an opening question. Do you paint outside the lines? Um, and and your, your response is you don't see lines. So so let's just start there. You, you look for shapes. I mean, we're, that was kind of one of my questions. I, I mean, you were a plein air painter um, initially, right? I, I look for shapes and values. Well, we got a bit of yeah, a... Yeah, I look for shapes and, and values primarily. Okay. Yeah. We got, we're having a bit of a lag in our sound. Yeah. So I don't know what, the, just the feed that's happening here a little bit. Yeah, but. I'm hearing. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll hope the, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully you can get through that. Um, so anyway, a little bit about your journey, I guess we'll call it. Let's just start there to say, where did you start? And, and you are now at a, a stage in your life that you now are going to paint, 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 right? You're just. Oh, uh, this is not good. I, I've been drawing since I was a little kid. Um, 
I just love to draw everything. I from the side didn't look like straight on. Yeah. Um, is this working, <laughs> Paul? Well, or I'm is gonna, it cutting out I'm too actually, much? I'm going to get David to put up our images, and then we can just talk in the background. There we go. So the images will be there, and uh, your voice will come through, okay. and we'll just then we'll you'll be frozen every once in a while. It seems they're getting a bad feed from somewhere the internet, but. Uh, as long as the voice comes through and get a little bit of a lag. So let's just, we'll try it and see how it goes. Okay. Okay. So can, yeah, you can continue. So yeah, I started this. drawing when I was young. I started drawing when I was young and yeah. when I was a little older, I wanted art in my house and uh, decided to take a course um, to make my own art. And it was very much the masters, how to paint, how to paint like the masters. Right. Um, which I learned so much, but I, I wanted a looser, looser look. I, I, it wasn't yeah. for me to be so <clears> tight. <throat> and so I didn't know how to do that, how to get my own style, all that stuff. And I'd learned that you're supposed to paint from life to get better everywhere. I learned that I had zero interest in landscapes, um, but I liked being outside. So I bought a plain air set and I started painting outdoors um, from life and quickly, uh, I do uh, still lifes as well, but I quickly got addicted because I love being outdoors and it's quite uh, tricky to catch the light as the light is changing and mm. to learn to move things around to make a better composition while yeah. you're out there. I, I just love it. And you're, you're battling mosquitoes and wind and cold. <laughs> and it's, it's challenging in a wonderful way. Yeah, no, very true. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, plein air painting is, uh, I think it's a thing, not unlike, I think an artist, every artist should try and learn how to paint watercolor, just just to get the idea of color mixing and those things. The same thing with plein air, you, you need to try it at least once or twice. Uh, you really don't know um, that you don't like peas unless you try eating peas, you know, it's the, and I think that's how plein air painting is, it's, it, uh, do you paint like do you paint in a group of people to, that of like mind? Did you hear? What, do you paint? Yeah. No, um, <laughs> I I prefer painting alone. I, I I've painted with some people that are really nice, but uh, I I have a hard time when talking happens when I'm yeah. painting. It uh, just uh, I'm totally immersed when I'm painting in the in in the painting, and if if there's a lot of conversation, then I'm pulled out of the painting separate. I love to visit with artists, but not while I'm painting, if that makes yeah. any sense at all. Yeah. No, it does. It uh, Unless, unless the other it. artist is of like mine. My husband is a painter. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's, um, I think and some. He, and he and I paint out. Well. Yeah. I think some, some are painting in groups is a social aspect of their life a little bit um some paint is for comfort um security those kinds of things that when you can paint on your own that uh that, that's really the salt you know you, you you like you said you're immersed in your work and so how do you how do you focus when you get in front of that place that you really like <clears throat> um I used to think initially that I had to go on these grand travels to find beautiful places. And mm. I've discovered that it's right, it's right next door. I don't go far from my house. And so my method is if I'm actively going out to paint sometimes I always have my paints in my car always. <laughs> so I can just, and a, and a warm coat and mittens and all those things. So if I'm going shopping and, and I see something I can pull over and paint. Um, so basically, if I, I just catch something that catches my eye, it's it, it just catches me and then I have to pull over and paint. Uh, so I set up my my easel. I have a hatchback um, um, RAV, RAV4 and I just put the back up so it gives me shade if I need shade. And I set up my easel there if I can. And, um, and then I set up my paints and I try to get going within like 10 minutes max. Yeah. to to paint what i'm what i'm seeing and, and i see i see 
things that are mundane that are not mundane to me anymore. Um, I just, I see, so I can drive a road and paint it 18 different times, aspects of it, but it might just be one clump of bushes or the sky <laughs> or who knows, something just looks incredibly beautiful to me on that day. Yeah. No, people can, uh, so I got a question. You got any paint on your car yet? All over. <laughs> <laughs> paint on my car, paint on my, I have a painting jacket, an old work jacket that I always put on because I, otherwise I'd be covered in paint, but typically my face is covered afterwards. And yeah, it yeah. Everywhere. yeah <laughs> it's you, one of the hazards. You, yeah. You haven't lived until you painted in about a 40 or 50 K wind uh, and trying to get behind a vehicle somehow to get out of the wind and trying to position yourself. It's a, it's a challenge. But there's no mosquitoes on those days, usually. But. Yeah. Um, the, it, no, no. But if it's too windy, um, like I've had my my easel blown over many times. <laughs> and it's it's aggravating. And it's really bad. I actually have to hold on to the easel. I even have it weighted, but I still have to hold on to it. So I'm like <laughs> painting with one hand and holding the easel, trying to clean my brush. And so it's it's challenging. Uh, interestingly, sometimes when I'm forced to, to work more quickly, I, I like some of those paintings best because I'm, again, not taken up by every leaf on the tree. I'm, I'm just trying to capture what, what I, de I deem as essential, what I, what I want to capture for that scene. Yeah, I have a, I have a dear friend now, quite elderly, but she, uh, she used to strap her canvases to the side of her car. And wow. uh, and uh, her car was called Old Paint. They used to call her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she would she would set up in the middle of inner city somewhere, and she would paint, and she'd just take that car everywhere. But she tie her canvases to the side so it didn't, they didn't fly away. <laughs> it's quite she was quite inventive uh, in doing that. Um, so I think you can do a lot of different things. You just have to be resourceful and figure out how you, what are you willing to put up with, you know, to, to, to get what you want, right? It, it really comes down to that. How much pain are you willing to go through to, to get that moment that you're there? And it's the ones who break through are the ones that take those chances. And that's, that's how I see it. I, I mean, I don't like painting in 20 below weather. Um, but some people paint from their car, you know, and I guess you reduce the size of your panel down a bit. Do you paint on a panel or canvas? Panel, wood panel with, um, that's all gessoed and oil, final oil. Um, yeah. And oil. So you paint, in, paint oil. in oils. Yeah. You paint in oils. Yeah. I paint in oils. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. It's, I do love, I love painting in winter and oils allow me to, to somewhat paint yeah. in winter. The yeah. coldest painting I've ever done was minus 28. And um, I, it was in my backyard. So basically I, I got the paints all ready. I set up my easel. I got all dressed up. I took the paints out. And within five minutes, I had to move to my palette knife. <laughs> um, and it, I think I got it done in 20 minutes. And I don't think I'd do it again. It was brutally cold, but it was a good painting. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, there, there. I guess there are different ways of doing those things um a couple of years ago i uh, i purchased uh a little spray booth from lee valley and it's uh it's a little tent with a clear window on the side of it you could so you can get into some shelter if you really had to stake it down you could go and get out of the wind it's you it's a little cool but you still look at elements that can help you get what you're looking for I mean, that's pretty brave to go out in 28 below uh, Celsius and uh, and do those things. A lot of people do it from behind windows in different uh, different ways, usually from cars, uh, from their windows. But And I think, do you use your phone at all for taking snapshots or are you kind of a draw, do the drawings? And I, I uh, take a snapshot in case when I first get there, in case the light changes before I'm done the painting. So if I need to reference back, I can look at it. But most of the time, it's also it's in case I ever want to do a studio piece as well, so I can I have the actual site. But the, not, the 
the camera doesn't capture the colors as I see them. That's what the point of the plain air is. is so then I can ref use the plain air and the camera to make a, a larger piece. But no, I, I prefer to draw with my brush. I just do a quick sort of uh, sketch in to know that I've got the, everything where I want it to be. If it's in winter, I don't do a thumbnail that much, uh, but I do try to do a thumbnail. I'm not sure about the composition because I, then I it, then I might do two or three thumbnails. So, which uh, just to make sure that my composition is gonna that it's gonna work. If it doesn't work in the thumbnail, the dark and the lights, it's not yeah. gonna work in a painting. So I don't want to waste that time. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I find some of the the plein air pieces are they're so fresh, right? And it and when it's cold or outside. You have a time that you have to get it done by. So there's there's a time deadline. And like you said, the light changes quite quickly, especially in the fall. It'll move. Summertime will give you a little bit longer light, um, you know, longer shadows, all those things that come. But you start painting in the fall, that sun moves quickly. So if you're in a long painting, uh, shadows change dramatically on your piece. So you, you, you have to get it down quickly in a, almost a gesture. That's what I found in, in, you know, if you're going to be true to what you're looking for, uh, but being able to capture that in half an hour, um, the essence of what you're doing is probably, and you want to ask, do I stop, right? <laughs> do, do, <laughs> yeah, move on, get another panel. I, do you take lots of blank panels with you just in case those moments happen with you? I always have a box of eight by tens and a box of, um, six by eights and I also have some larger ones um, in case some different dimensions depending on the scene um, yeah. in winter I tend to paint smaller that it's I won't go back past eight by ten just like you said the practicality I have to get that done quicker because I'm going to freeze if I don't um, and the light is much more unforgiving in winter um, because it changes so quickly but I just, I, I, I pr almost prefer winter, winter painting because it's just the warmth of the sun on the snow and the, the shadows. There's just such a contrast and, and a starkness to it. And, and I, I love winter always have. Um, so, so there's a lot of emotion <laughs> when I'm painting the scene and I'm, and I think that sort of comes across in the, for plain air painters, because you're you're so immersed in this, right? I wish I could get the sounds and the smells and everything in there too. This is not a winter picture, but we're no. moving some pictures along um, is as background for people to look at when we're. Did you want to speak to some of this 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 piece? Do you want to go back and talk about that winter piece? No, no, this one this is fine. We can. Um, what caught me here? I this is actually there's a highway right here, and then there was a little pull off here uh, into the farmer's field. It was this beautiful sort of bucolic look of this scene and that patch, the little patch of water on the road up there reflecting the light, just, I had to stop. <laughs> so, um, and, and so, so I, I had to stop and get this down. This is one of my larger paintings. So it took a little bit longer, but yeah, I was just, it was all about that patch of, of sunlight on the, yeah. On the yeah, and your eye, your eye does just goes down that little trail road all the way bang right to it. You know, it's planning planning imagery in a quick in a quick piece is is sometimes it's just intuitive and it's instinctive as to what you need to do. I come in from this side, I carry off, um, you know, let things bleed off to the left and right. I mean, there's a little puddle of I guess a slew or water on the right hand side, but it's not the most important thing. It, it tells you about the moment and the place, but. Um, yeah, you're trying to bring the, to circle the eye around sort of, right? So I move ooh. things around when I, when I paint, like that tree wasn't there. It was over further to the right, but it, it needed a stopper with that line I wanted to use to bring in. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think I, I sort of think about stuff like that when I'm painting. Uh, like even on the the brush strokes, you, you kind of want to, you don't want the eye to be drawn away. Um, mm -hmm. So there is, it is, you're right. It's, it's thinking, but I, it, it's, it's back of the brain thinking <laughs> at this it's point. Called, it's called experience. I think um, it's intuitive with some, mm -hmm. you don't have to, you don't have to paint every tree and you can move things around. You're allowed to do that. 
I, <laughs> and, but I think it's, it's coming down is trying to give the, this, the moment feeling, right? Even just down to understanding the, the pulling of the green, light greens in behind the trees. I mean, there's a horizon line there, but you're also trying to create some depth when you don't have, say, hydro lines or diminishing road. Like this one has a, a road that diminishes back down to the light. But your eye wants to stop at that little sparkle of water at the end. And so you, you got to keep your interest up, but only as a painter as well. Your interest first, then the viewer's interest. If you're not interested in it, it moves on into another life form. <laughs> Usually it <laughs> uh, gets another painting over top of it. So do you do you paint over top of your old works that aren't working or do you scratch them off or what do you do? Um, I've learned I used to uh, it's hard to judge when I'm first done a painting. So sometimes I, I think, oh, what a what a crappy painting. <laughs> but I've learned that I and sometimes I just love the painting. I'm, I learned to give it 24 to 48 hours. And then I look again yeah. and, and it's like, oh, I loved that. <laughs> no, no, no. And because I'm in oils, I can just wipe it out. Um, yeah. And then I use the board again, and yeah. and uh, some really bad ones from my earlier painting I kept because I learned a lot by looking at it. Like why was why is this so bad? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to keep that as a reference that I have I have changed. When you first start painting, you make these leaps, and it's like oh I'm getting better. And then later on, I think it's harder to know that if you're getting better or not. And so it's nice to have some bad ones. I've got this wall of not, they're not, not in a wall, but it's stored on a shelf of paintings just to show that there has been some progression. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, if I don't like them, some, I've been out there and absolutely hated painting. And my husband said afterwards, you made a mistake. That was good. But, but I just couldn't stand it. So I just wiped it right out. And then I <laughs> let the bar dry a bit and paint over it. So, yeah. Yeah. so you, you, so you have critique night occasionally with a glass of wine, do you? You put everything up, you and your husband? Yeah, yeah. He's he's a painter too, so it helps, yeah. right? So yeah. we uh, we he, we tend to critique after the day after a painting. Uh, we we talk if we go out together. We discuss each other's paintings, but sometimes it's just again too immediate. I prefer to wait a day, and then I'm going to see the things that maybe I didn't see in the love yeah. of the moment. Yeah. So. So even if I like a painting, there's something to learn that I could have changed or could have improved. Yeah. So. Well, I, uh, I think that's it's a valuable advice for a lot of people. Uh, just don't be too cruel on yourself the first 48 hours. You know, put it away, come back to it, do another one, go back to it. There's things a lot of times your your mind and your body pick up that you don't know at the moment. You're in a moment so deep when you're painting. It's just not there for you to see until later on. And you wonder whether people even see that moment, <clears throat> say, when they're, it's framed. <laughs> and you, <clears throat> you, can, you can understand and you want to explain it to somebody, but you go, don't go there. Don't tell people what to see. Please don't do that. <laughs> Pointing yes. arrows and fingers. But, but it's really <laughs> nice when people do spot those moments that, uh, that the reason why you stopped, uh, why you captured something that, your subconscious probably caught more so than your conscious. Exactly. Uh, if you sometimes you find sometimes if you try too hard, they it just doesn't work. I, that's another reason I use my camera. To, when I think I'm done a painting, sometimes I'll take a picture of it and then look at the picture, and I can see a problem on the picture that I couldn't see on the painting, okay. and I don't know why that is. I'm always also surprised. I sell a, a lot of my plein air paintings and I'm surprised the paintings sometimes that I'm thinking, I don't even know if this should be for sale. They'd be the first to go and I'll have ones that I, I love and it doesn't sell. So I, I, uh, it, it's all, it's like you said, I don't want to speak too much about this is what this is because obviously people see different things. So. Yeah. This is very true, you know, uh, um, myself as well. You'll paint a painting you think this one is going to fly out of day one, you know, and you go, I've still got this one. Is it a dog? What, what's wrong with this one? <laughs> why, why doesn't it resonate with people? And then part of the problem we it's as artists probably true. overthink, we overthink things. Now, I, now I'm starting to try to paint to an audience and I go, don't go down that road. 
I mean, I really tell artists, paint for yourself first as much as you can. I realize we all have to make a living and, you, you, you know, it's just, I wish I had five of these, you know, those ones <laughs> to sell if it's, it's so-called the hot item. But do you want to go down that road where you're painting that same image over and over again the same way? It's one thing when it goes to, I love seeing pieces where there's uh, seasonal transitions on the same space. So you you go to that place and say, I'm going to paint this one for the next year, but I'm going to paint it every two months. And it's nice just to keep those and put them on a wall and look at them as a body of work. So it's a, it's a different kind of conversation. Um, do you paint stuff in a series at all? Like say, I'm going to, I'm going to paint, um, you know, farmlands for instance, or buildings or, these brushes of trees or brushes really excite me. Do I paint that for a long time and then create a show from it? <clears throat> I haven't yet. It's something uh, I recently retired. And so I haven't, didn't have a lot of time to paint. It was always just a piece here, a piece there. When I painted still lifes, I did do a show or two that was like uh, focused on fruit or uh, food, um, yeah. food related <clears throat> stuff. And actually those, those did really well. Um, and I have another series or two that I would like to do again, that's more studio work inside, but, um, plain air, possibly plain air for me though, is more about, it's just overwhelming emotion of, at a, at a, in a moment and, uh, and gratitude for being alive and for being out there and for mm -hmm. seeing things. And so it's, it's actually, it's almost overwhelming for me sometimes, uh, what happens it's it's almost a spiritual thing for me plain air mm -hmm. so i don't i i i, I maybe I, you know i like that idea too and i've liked pa paintings i've seen of others where they do this the seasonal changes um but if it doesn't catch me in in if mm -hmm. i go back there and it doesn't catch me i'm going to struggle to do that painting so, mm -hmm. so i haven't done it yet but it might be something i would do later on yeah we've had uh um other artists talk about exactly what you did. What they were looking for really was in their own backyard. Um, and he didn't have to travel around the world. Uh, we had a conversation just recently with an artist that did that. And I think he painted his favorite spots a number of different times of the year. And you can sort of see there are a little bit of changes. You know, they're not depicting exactly where the hill is or things like that. But it's... Uh, so those become your favorite little haunts. So you, do you have kind of, am I going out on from your place? Do you hang a left and you always go to that? Let's see what it looks like there today. I don't have my favorite haunt, a uh, favorite haunt. I, I do have some roads that I, I was going to do a series of paintings on Range Road 242 because I loved the scenery there when I first started. Um, and I might still someday do that. Uh, but I don't go far. I, I, sometimes it's like four kilometers from home. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's literally in my back, back alley or my backyard. Sometimes it's across the street. It's, it's, it's places. So I take the dog for a long walk every morning and there's a stand of trees. I've painted a couple of times just because I see them in the different seasons and they're yeah. beautiful. And it, when, when I'm walking, I have, uh, if I see something, I'll run back home, grab my car, drive out there. And because I have to paint it. It's just like, wow, I've got to get this. Yeah. You haven't like, made the backpack for the dog yet to carry your brushes and stuff with you, right? <laughs> no, no. I'd like to get a bike trailer. Um, and then so we could just bike because it's local. But typically I, it's it's somewhere within about 10 kilometer radius. Now there's exceptions. There's times I go outside that zone. But I, I think what's important to me is I, I love living. And I love home. <laughs> I'm a homebody. <laughs> and I love, I love, I love the whole earth. But this is I, I'm trying to share what I see, what what I think is incredibly beautiful. And it's it's it can be the scrap of weeds coming up through yeah. pavement. Honestly, it's just it's just the everyday stuff that I think we tend to to not see sometimes. And and it's it's to me where where the magic is. Um, well, it's uh, <clears throat> it, it's it's a great um, release, I guess, for someone to be able to do that. Like I think that that fulfills um, even 
this an artist? Do you do you uh, occasionally enlarge a piece, like in the in the studio, to say this one might make a big, nice big one, or is big important? I don't know. That, um, that's why I've taken taken photos, uh, so I could, in theory, do that. I've done it once or twice, but I I feel like I. Uh, like, I feel like I lose something in that transition because I tighten up in the studio and I, I, if I, if I treat it like a, a larger plain air, I have an easier time with it. But that, that is something I think I would like to try. I, I, I think also though with art, because I think part of the reasons my, my work sells is because it, it fits a different niche of, of the market, right? It doesn't cost you five thousand dollars to get this huge painting you, it's it's right. less expensive to have a smaller painting and um storage <laughs> i have so many plain air paintings here yeah but shelves of it literally hundreds and hundreds so i think man if i did too many large paintings i i'm not a i'm not drawn to being a large large painter but you know at mid, mid size yes that that interests me that's that's that considered a large painting then when you get up to that big like mid size 11 yeah. 14 16 20 24 like by, yeah 16 20 to me that's large 24 by something would be 24 by 36 would be a very large painting for me yeah. um and and i know i love people who do really large works but um yeah. i love the impact of them but i always say me, yeah, by 36 when, did. <laughs> When, when you want to carry this feeling that you're doing here into a larger format, you got to increase the size of your brush. <laughs> you, you definitely do. And I do paint with pretty large brushes in plain air, even on a small board. I use a, a large brush and I use a very limited palette. Yeah. So. Well, I see you have seasonal palettes that you work through, whether it has your fall palette and in a winter palette as well. Um, so winter, like the winter scenes, you I mean, I, do they give you, like you said, there's a harder, harsher or sharper edge to things. So, cause the whites and the, the light grays of snow trapping against a tree, this one sort of has it. It's a, it's a kind of a hard edged painting with, uh, uh, the dark umber tree with, uh, colors in behind it, like very bright colors in behind it. So. Yeah, it's a very unique tree, by the way. It's it's got a there's a a strange you in that, you know. There's just a when you paint this kind of tree, you didn't paint the whole tree. You only paint like you're looking through these bars of bark and and wood into what's going. It creates a barrier in the foreground, and then it's about the midground. The light is in the midground. Uh, so are those moments, are those the kind of the things that you see maybe when you when you stop? Is that that sparkle of light? This was what I saw. Um, and I want I wanted to push myself and try different things too, right? So this was, uh, the light was behind so that the tree was in, was very dark um, and the sparkle of light in between it and beside it, it caught my eye and I thought, okay, this is different. This is going to be maybe harder <laughs> so um so i yeah i pulled over i just loved how the light uh i loved the tree it was a very old tree and it was it was it was um it was very old and gnarly and minimal minimalized at this at the at the edges and so yeah i i wanted to paint that the and the light coming from behind it the backlit with yeah, the yeah. the light in front it just, it just, it just was to me, it was just so beautiful. Like I, the thing about painting, I, I, and you probably had this too. I, I assume others do. I can't tell you where this was, like which road it was, but I never forget when I paint something from life, I never forget that. So I remember once um, we were, I'd drawn, painted some mountains. And when we were coming back from BC, it was like, I rec this, this was a different direction. I recognized that that was the mountain I had painted. It, I almost could fly in the air and see the map and the way around the road would go and where I'd painted from. Yeah. Uh, and and so I just, 
if I come across this tree again, <laughs> I will know it instantly. Uh, I feel yeah. I feel connection to everything that I paint. I recognize it later. Yeah, no, it's uh, it has. I don't know. I guess I'm feeling a, a reaching out. There's a feeling. All it's not humanistic thing, but it's there's, there's there's a reaching, and I don't know why it's doing that to me. But I I feel there's a connection thing, and maybe it's because it's been cropped off top and bottom, and it's uh, it's a dominant shape. But uh, I, I find it's it's quite it's quite evocative. It really is a painting, and quite abstract as well. You know, there's really. Um, and I, and I love it that there's not just a blue sky in the background. I mean, that creates, if there's a blue sky, that gives me too much depth for what this piece is about. I think uh, the palette being warm all the way to the top pretty much, um, I don't know. It, it does flatten the piece out, but it's really a, it is really about other things. And I just, I just love seeing it because it's, it's quite different than some of the other pieces of work that we show. Thanks. Yeah. There's this, uh, you know, in, in Canada, we have a lot of these beautiful little ponds and sloughs. And uh, I mean, there's beautiful little life forms that are, they're just, we don't need to see Monet's garden a lot of times. You know, like you said before, it's right there for us. Nature has already made it for us. And seasonally, it, you go, oh my gosh, it changed. Two weeks later, it changed again. And again, and yeah. again, and I didn't have to weed it. And it's again. <laughs> <laughs> and the scents are really part of it to me. So when I see this, I can remember this. The, the slough was not a stinky slough, but I can the scent in the trees. There was trees to the left of me here that I didn't include. A little forest. Um, uh, uh, in the fall, you get that strong. I don't know if it's across the whole country, but here you get that dirty sock smell of the cranberries. And, and I love that smell because that to me is fall. And then I hear birds. Everything happens connected to that. So, yeah. 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 And, and that you can't smell that here. But if, if you know this country, and you clearly do, um, you can probably smell them too. Yeah. The highbush yeah, high cranberries <laughs> as they're <Yeah>. maturing. <laughs> but we also get the canola crops that do the same thing. And yeah. uh, they have that fall scent that's in the air and uh, we go through a lot of that I think do you like painting that the rural aspect of um, agriculture in, in your works at all do you like the do the lines of cultivation uh, like delineate the line uh, the landscape nicely for you in other words this harmonious repetition of line going in the same direction create these lovely patterns and you think how flat that field is. And then you look at those lines and you realize, how the heck am I ever going to paint that? Because they, they not only, there's multiplicity of lines, they diminish and they, they cross over and they do a lot of different things. So they create complicated brushwork. Um, but is that a challenge for you? Like, do you like those kind of challenges? Yeah, I do. I, I do. And I, I, I find those almost easier because I have, but yeah, you're right. It's, you have to get those perspectives right <laughs> of the lines or it's not going to work. But um, I, I, there's, I like chaos, the beauty and chaos too. So, and yet I feel very scared when I pull over and see a bunch of trees that, that I want to paint close with maybe a field behind because it's like, okay, how, how, <laughs> how am I going to get this? Like this one, this one scared me to death. <laughs> but I wanted to, to do it, so I decided I was just going to do it. Yeah. Um, and and but there's a lot of moments where I'm scared because it's like how, <laughs> and then I I have to think for a minute and a uh, minute or five, and and then try to get it. And and I learn when I'm doing that too, right? I'm learning what it was even. It was those grasses, but what it was that, and and. Uh, but yeah, I love fields. I've, I've done a number of the fields and I, and I have this absolute love for tele, tele, uh, power poles as well. I have done a lot of power pole paintings. Yeah. I think, I think A.Y. Jackson was probably one of the, 
one of the really nice, great plein air painters. And he could paint snow and winter scenes, just, you know, dash, 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 and they would be done. Um, and were, I think he, you know, painted on panels as well as canvas, but I think his best work were probably done on location. And he traveled all through Ontario and Quebec and the north a bit. And uh, I think even out to the west coast a little bit, a couple of trips. But I think these, this is reminiscent of that with me when I see these, these warm, these warm, uh, warm light on snow, right? And uh, this one really has a warm, cool feeling to it. And it's, uh, it's a lovely winter painting without it being a cold winter painting. You know, it still, it still can be cold, but when somebody buys one of these little panels, it, it just adds a little gem to their wall, I think. I mean, it's a beautiful painting. This is the one we opened with. I, was, I kind of did a close cut of it, but this is the uh, the full image. Oh, how big is this one? Eight by 10? I think, I think it's eight by 10, yeah. Yeah, about eight by 10. How do you, how do you carry those panels when they're wet? I, I have um, an eight by 10 panel box that I bought years ago and a six by eight panel box that I bought years ago. So I store my, my ones that I'm going to, I can paint on in there and it's, and then I put them in there. When <clears> they <throat> right. If I do a larger one, I have an 11 four by 14 panel box that my husband made for me. And if it's an odd shape, I just uh, put it in the footwell of the passenger seat <laughs> when I'm, when I'm driving back, yeah. hence there's paint there as well. So yeah it's always tough you know you're lugging stuff around right and you like you mentioned you'd be nice if you had the little the the bike and the, the thing that you could pull behind your bike and uh i mentioned this elderly lady i i i really like her work and i helped her make make one of those uh, some old lawnmower handles and a bunch of different things and so she could and it had straw wheels and she could take that thing along the river bank when she used to paint the lilac trees when they were in bloom and uh so it was i think we're of device right artists need to figure out and i don't know how many paint boxes i've made over the years and ways of how do i make it better for me how do i make it i i can do it better than paying eight or nine hundred dollars for and i've spent <laughs> many hours part of it is you like to pull your cleaner on one side and your tissues on the other side or whatever things you used to wipe with and now you know environmentally where do you put your your fluids and things that you're using so that you can take them back and take care of them properly um so this one a little cooler painting so winter but um i think we've all been there we've seen those trees that struggle and, and i see this one there there's a they're holding their ground <laughs> and uh, that's all I can say. They're holding their ground, and uh, they, you know, they're gnarly trees, and uh, they got a lot of character to them. Right? Kind of. So these would be a probably a poplar tree, I must imagine, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're a really quick growing tree, and they, if you, if you knock a piece off of it, it'll sprout from that piece, and so you get all these. They get a little all convoluted and they break off and they do different things but they uh they populate the prairies quite a bit so again a mid a mid color light uh warm light going through with a cool in the foreground and uh you know it seems to be one of your your go-to things and then i kind of like to see that uh, you love those mid mid light in the mid ground um the nice contrast between warm and cool, you know, and you can have that even in the wintertime. So it's uh, things to aspire to for many artists. This was a little flatter light, but uh, yeah. Yeah. it was, it was very flat. Um, but I just loved the way all the bushes came out in the snow and there were tracks in the snow and, um, and it was getting closer to spring. Right. It was, but it was quite co quite cold still and so i just um yeah i just was taken by the and and again i love those scruffy grasses that come up through the snow yeah i guess i'm saying one of my favorite pieces in this is is right in the middle that 
you know, the, um, I don't know if people can see the mouse, this piece in here, in the, in the middle. Uh, and it's just that beautiful umbers and siennas, and then you pull just a little bit of white in behind, and that snaps the page. And they said, there's a, do you ever do like croppings where you'll, you know, you'll, you'll do this little thing or you made any cropping devices that uh, you can find some other paintings within a painting sometimes. Um, this one feels like it's on the shore of a lake, you know, a little bit, but it's not, it's probably a field. Yeah, it's a field. Yeah. 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 But uh, it, again, I was painting, I paint most of my, because I drive uh, most of my paintings and I feel safer having my car near me um, when people can be around. Um, uh, you know, I've had I'm, it. I paint by myself, and I get painting with others because I have had. Uh, I've painted for years, like a decade, and I've only had two scary times, <laughs> but I still feel safer because of that having my car there. So on this one, the I was high. The road was high because there is just to the right of those trees. There's a, a body of water, right. so it was very low ground. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, need to, I, you need to put a great big beware of dog sign in your window of your car. <laughs> <laughs> I have my dog with me all the time and he's an 80 pound dog, but he's a collie, a <laughs> collie mix. And so he would lick someone to death. <laughs> no, no danger there, but hopefully yeah. people don't know that from looking yeah, at him. You, give him a, you need to give him a Doverman mask or something. <laughs> <laughs> he can wear the Doverman mask. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, and I think it's a risk for anybody painting alone to be aware of their, where they are and, uh, and what's, uh, you know, what do you do in, in a sense of, you know, caution, I guess we call it, um, you know, to be, be careful, just don't go out and do plein air painting without thinking about it. And when you start out probably as a group or two or three of you, is safer than uh, by yourself, especially on a lonely road. You don't want to be doing that. Make sure your cell phone's charged and uh, and such. But uh, the response time is usually not well in the country. You, you've got to take care of yourself. Um, but just capturing these moments, are, we, we really appreciate that. This one's really got a really nice bang light, you know. First building I've seen in one of your works, you know. It's just... What made you do the building? Like, where, where, where did this? This is just in the town of Legal, and where I walk the dog all the time. There's this little shed <laughs> at the bottom of a field uh, as we come over the hill, and I've loved it for years. But um, it's not a great place to paint with the dog because I, I he I don't want him loose, and then he's just going to be a pain in the butt. So <laughs> I this was. I, I again we'd taken a walk and the light was just like I, I've got to paint this today today's the day so we turned around I took him home and I drove out there and and did the painting yeah um, the light was just so beautiful on the trees and the and that little red building I just it's I don't know what it looks like up close but <laughs> but I sure love it from the distance so yeah well you know you're putting a small panel on the wall it gives you that distance feeling when you look at sort of like looking at a window and you're seeing what you're seeing when you see a small painting like that. You can go, oh, that's it's a beautiful moment. I mean, and, and you're painting, um, you know, that field and uh, the colors again are quite nice, warm, nice, warm feeling. Yeah. Canola, I would imagine. This is a canola field in harvest. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not uh, sure. Once the crops are down, I know canola when it's not down, yeah. <laughs> and I've this done is, a, lot, a yeah. lot of canola paintings. But um, yeah, yeah I just is, love this field. Yeah, this has been uh, windrowed, and it, it's it's a canola field, I would say. But uh, it, it, you know, Van Gogh painted quite a few like workers in fields and. This color, color palette kind of reminds a little hard edge shadow edges and they catch those edges and it, it, it's difficult to paint um, a lot of these things because just the perception of the depth of perception and 
how wide is the windrow relative to the space between the windrow? So does it look realistic? And does it make sense? There's that much crop came out of that windrowed area in the middle, right? Yet it's still, you don't, has uniformity, but without uniformity. And it, uh, this is all converging to the center space on from the left and to the right. So it's got a, it forces my eye to want to go all the way down to that little scratchy white that's happening back on the right side there and in, in the middle of the painting. So the works of, I, I want to go behind there. I want, I want to follow, I know what's out front and it's two thirds of the painting is about the crop, but really it's about that, passageway in behind that long clump of trees that I want to go where it's a little bit lighter green of the tree. Um, I call these August greens. Uh, that's kind of my the way I call a when they start getting darker. And uh, I, I just I love that I love that way that I my eye wants to go there and discover what is there and you've left a big question mark for me is there more crop like this is there <clears throat> what view am i missing you know by not going down there but but it's a lovely piece and it's it's a bold piece and that's you know when you paint these converging lines is that strength um it's got to be held together with something and i think you've done that really nicely with the the greens have really laid a horizon line at the top of that hill and and uh and put it put it in a really nice yeah so Thanks. lovely you've really thought that through you've helped me think that through because i was taken by those trees in the on the right that you're talking about <laughs> that was when i was there that was what caught me but i had to get the field in to get there <laughs> and yeah. and um i love the field too but it was really difficult uh to paint this because there's different hills and little dips so it wasn't is this going to read as going back because i can see this and my brain is saying but that line should be going here mm -hmm. but i <laughs> it it but it was those that clump of trees and just in behind it that was yeah. what was capturing me when i was painting it I'm, I'm glad you didn't paint all the little uh stalks that were diminishing in between you just indicate what's going on it it what it does if you do that it it, it complicates the painting where the viewers can confuse what is the most important thing. And I think you as a plein air painter and the time you just paint what you feel and it works out. I mean, it just, it, you know, you say, I don't have time to paint every one of those little stalks. No. <laughs> <laughs> Move on. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's really about other things in here. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's got a, and you're right. When the land kind of moves, you know, it's, you still want to get the rhythms of what's going on, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's just in your style and how you do things. Yeah, this is a little bit of rougher country here. I just, I love this mishmash of the brush and the foreground. And it's just indication of deadfall, indication of grasses. And it sets the tone for the piece. So one piece is not underworked more than the other pieces. So there's even your the warm trees in the background. It, it, it's an abstract shape of color with a little texture over top to give you a feeling of depth and light. And I, it's a nice, I like the change of your grays and the way things go. And I think it's, uh, it gives you a nice warm winter feeling and, or late winter feeling. I don't know. Is this more of a March thing? It is exactly that. Yeah. March, March yeah. April. Yeah. 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 March can be kind of a cool month. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a transition month a lot of times, but uh, somewhere our coldest weather can happen in March. Yeah, yeah, I think this is April and sometimes even May, right? Depending on on the, on the year. North, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the, on the north side of a something, it would be uh, still have snow, and the south side would be melted a bit. But yeah, and uh, well, it's a it's a lovely piece. I would love to see this bigger. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's bigger. Um, if you have a time, you should go to the Peter Robertson Gallery this week and take a look what's going on there. Um, I can't remember the artist's name, but he does large landscapes and goopy thick, very thick. I can't remember, his, darn, I can't remember his name. But anyway, go there and uh, if you want to be inspired by 
bold landscape and they're big big canvases can't imagine what they weigh because the paint's about an inch thick <laughs> and uh it's i don't know how long it took to dry how long does your panels usually take to dry about it depends if there's white in them or not white is uh I, i've made the mistake of leaving a white painting in a box winter painting in the box uh, and the problem with that is that <laughs> they, um uh, the paint can can yellow a bit, <laughs> the white can yellow a bit, and it um, it doesn't dry at all. So I try to get them out. But if there's white in it, it, it takes a good two, three months for, yeah. for it to dry. And that tends to be where I'm, I'm thickest, too. So sometimes even six months. Um, but if there's no white, it, it's sooner, a couple months, a month. So do, you, do you not use some uh, drying agents at all, a Japan dryer or anything at all, and some alkyd dryers that help to... To uh, you know, speed up the drying a little bit. No. Not not for plain air, no. Especially in winter because uh, <clears throat> I I don't want them drying quickly because then I I'm uh, I have to paint even faster. Yeah. So, yeah. So is it like a titanium whites that you use, or are they flake? Um, no, I use titanium white. Yeah. Some of the other uh, yeah the flake white and I can't remember the zinc whites. They have said they're not. They're not as good a white. They they don't. They're more. I guess they use them mostly for transparencies in doing portraiture. Yeah. But they uh, they yellow and they're not very. Uh, they're kind of fugitive actually, and so they're not very. They don't hold their white, um, and they they found that over the years. So I don't know whether so-called golden or some of the other ones have perfected in making it better. But most of us tend to use titanium. There's a white, there's a titanium white that I try to buy that I can't remember the name of the brand, but it has no zinc in it. And I, I, I try to use that because it will stay whiter, but I use that primarily in the studio. <clears throat> yeah. I, I just learned that a lot of times snow is not white. No, it's ne <laughs> never, it's never white. It's actually it's what's reflecting on it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. But, and I just found with sometimes uh, titanium uh, mixing too much pigment with it, it, it dulls your colors it really it pulls the life out of a color if you keep adding white to something you think you think it's going to make it lighter but you should be looking at your other colors and make them darker or yes. deeper not darker but deeper and you know that'll make your palette brighter so it's opposite yeah. to what you think it and yeah. you've got to force yourself to think that way it's uh it's tantalizing to always just squeeze a little white on your your palette just in case right yeah but, no it's it's tricky exactly right it's um it's uh it's everything's relative to each other so that's something that took me a long time to learn is that you have to make things darker or like you said deeper more contrast i think more to, yeah to make to make that white that isn't white pop <laughs> well we're like looking at this little panel right here you really what makes it pop is the overprint of the uh, the blue over top of the snow in the foreground. So you've created a cool entry into the painting. This one is the larger painting, but I just took a snippet of it. Uh, this of a road, but it's really about there's three or four planes in here. There's the blue and the mid ground, the trees and the sky, and they're they're very abstract in the way they look. So do you paint mostly horizontal formats, like eight tens that way, or do you do any verticals at all? Like I, this building right here, vertical. I do some verticals, yeah, but I mostly mostly horizontal. Yeah, uh, I just it. find them personally more pleasing paintings usually. Um, so yeah. mostly hor horizontal. But when I'm trying something different, I do I do a vertical, and sometimes what I'm wanting to capture. So those dark trees, if I'd wanted it to be about, uh, you know, to get the whole tree in, I would have had to use the you vertical. You just keep adding panels. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> seen some of the master's paintings and you can see where they've actually stitched canvas onto them to extend them because they go oh i need to had an eye an idea that i better expand on and they add a piece of canvas and you can see where it's been added on um so they didn't have their really good little thumbnail done before they started so much for the masters uh aspect of them but uh i think i started doing diptychs and triptychs and you say, oh, I could add another piece on, another piece on. And they're just panels that are banged up against each other. 
or spaced apart, whatever you want to do. But it's a way of expanding things and having fun with them. But anyway, this has been it's been great. Our time is pretty much up, and I'm going to hopefully our uh, our host David. Oh, there he is. He's got. Yeah, well, just to expand the uh, the panels, I thought I'd join you. Yeah, you didn't fall asleep, I guess. <laughs> no, 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 not this time. <laughs> not this time. Well, yeah, well. It's... No, I'm uh, just enjoying all the really vibrant colours. And um, of course, it's always my job or our job then, because Paul's <laughs> way too polite to ask, Karen. But um, if we were wanted to purchase one of your uh, wonderful paintings, what sort of price range are they are they situated in? Um, the eight by tens, I believe they just changed. I believe they're four twenty. I could be wrong. Um, and the nine by twelves are like four fifty, and the six by eights are in the three fifty range. There you go. Very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. yeah and very reasonable. That's a lot yeah. of color on your wall for not a lot of bucks. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of color, not a lot of box. <laughs> Whatever that means, you can have that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see a, a nice white wall with one or two paintings on them. That's going to be just yeah. lovely. Yeah, but actually, a lot of these kind of paintings can be, if they're that kind of size, they make a little four, four nice four little groupings, and they kind of have a nice seasonal look about them. And it can occupy the same amount of space as a large painting, and actually have more more conversation in them, uh, especially if these four pieces are actually uh, connected in conversation somehow. Yeah. So I think that's the wonderful thing about certainly like this sort of artwork, these huge splashes of color, <clears throat> is to just keep your rooms to as minimum as possible, and then you add this this artwork, and your whole room comes alive. Yeah. And I think, you know, people are just obsessed with painting the walls, all sorts of weird and wacky colors, and yeah, I've always been sort of trying to keep it as light as possible. Yeah. And, uh, let, the, let, the, let the paintings do the talking. Yeah, don't buy cushions, buy paintings. <laughs> <laughs> and, on, and on that note, yeah. <laughs> thank well, you so we... much, Paul. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm going to wind up because we're coming up to our hour mark. It's been yeah. an absolute joy to, uh, to listen in to the conversation and to enjoy it. And I hope everybody else has as well. Um, Paul has a new guest every week on Canadian Art Today. And, um, yeah, on behalf of 2OF, we would like to thank Paul for, for always bringing some wonderful guests. And you have been exceptional this week, Karen. So thank you so much for being with us. And don't forget, everybody, if you like the, uh, Canadian Art Today, you have to subscribe, get all your updates. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody very soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hang Thank in you. there. Yeah. Hang